You know how every pilot's got that one airplane they secretly dream about? For most pilots, that was the BD BD-5, a tiny, high-performance home built that looked like a fighter and promised jet-like speed on a budget. The BD-5 was marketed in the early 1970s as an affordable but high-performance home-built aircraft, pitched as the ultimate pilot's toy, a personal rocket ship you could build in your garage. But as many builders soon discovered, the design was far less refined than the brochures made it look. It was a demanding airplane to construct, tricky to rig, and in the hands of less experienced pilots, unforgiving to fly. Too many builder pilots never made it past their first few hours in the cockpit. The BD-5 was the brainchild of Jim Beatty, an engineer who had already turned out a few successful kit planes and knew how to excite the home-built crowd. On paper, this looked like the next big leap. Sleek, retractable gear and near-jet performance for the price of a family car. Beatty himself was the kind of designer every test pilot both admires and fears. He was visionary, restless, and absolutely convinced he could bend physics to his will. He had the gift of selling the dream as hard as he chased it. But that confidence often pushed the project beyond what a small shop could realistically deliver. He believed smart engineering and sheer will could overcome material limits, cost constraints, and a very tight center of gravity envelope. The same optimism that powered the BD-5's creation ultimately sent it into a stall. The BD-5 made its debut at Oshkosh in July 1971, and right away it turned heads. It wasn't just another boxy home-built, it looked like a scaled-down jet fighter sitting on the flight line. Beatty marketed it as a true build-at-home kit. All you had to do was put down $400 toward a total cost of around $2,000, and you could own a 200-knot airplane you built yourself. He claimed a pilot could put it together in 600 to 800 hours using basic hand tools without factory jigs or exotic skills. Adjusted for inflation, that meant roughly a $2,700 deposit toward a $14,000 airplane in today's money. For that price, you were getting retracts, a bubble canopy, and performance numbers that rivaled certified singles costing 10 times as much. Beatty told buyers that, putting in just a couple of hours a day, they could go from boxes of parts to a flyable airplane in a year or two. At the time, that was a bold promise. Most home builds in the early 70s, like the KR-2 or Sonorai-2, were simple wooden fabric tail draggers that topped out around 120 to 150 miles per hour. The Rutan Varies hadn't even flown yet. None of them offered retractable gear, a metal monocoque with fiberglass fairings, or the promise of a microjet down the line. Against that backdrop, the BD-5 looked like something out of a science fiction magazine. Fighter-like speed for used car money. With an empty weight around 400 pounds and detachable wings for trailering or garage storage, it was marketed as the ultimate personal aircraft. The idea of owning a mini high-performance airplane within reach of an average pilot's budget was irresistible. Within months, BD had taken in millions in deposits as thousands of pilots lined up for kits. Part of the buzz came from how the BD-5 seemed to leapfrog every other kit plane of its day. Compared with the KR-2 and Sonorai, which were honest stick-and-rudder sport planes, or the upcoming Varese with its unconventional canard layout, the BD-5 looked and felt like something from another era. It didn't just promise performance, it promised style. In a decade when most kits were little more than modernized cubs or plywood tail draggers, the BD-5 looked like a personal jet, and that image sold faster than BD could build airframes. But once the airplane actually left the ground, the story started to unravel. When Jim Beatty took the first prototype up in September 1971, it didn't fly anything like the brochure suggested. The airplane was pitch-sensitive, unstable in roll, and generally a handful. The test flights quickly turned into a months-long effort to tame the handling. By May 1972, more than a year after he'd started collecting deposits, Beatty finally managed a complete test hop. The airplane flew better, but the engine quit mid-flight, forcing an early landing. After a few more revisions, the controllability issues were ironed out, and the BD-5 started to behave like a real airplane, at least aerodynamically. The power plant was another story. 
Even while orders were pouring in, Beatty had already shelved the original 36-horsepower Polaris engine from the prototype and was scrambling to find a suitable replacement. He needed something light, compact, and reliable, a near-impossible combination in that power range, and that search would soon become the BD-5's biggest Achilles heel. As it turned out, finding a power plant that hit the sweet spot for weight, size, and output was tougher than BD expected. He needed something in the 60 to 70 horsepower range that could live at sustained RPM, handle prop loads, and still be cheap enough to fit the $2,000 kit price. That combination doesn't really exist off the shelf. The engine he eventually settled on was a 650cc Hearth snowmobile unit, which is lightweight, compact, and easy to source, at least on paper. But like most ground engines adapted for flight, it wasn't happy living at continuous power. Cooling, vibration, and reliability all became headaches, and as we'll touch on later, it never turned into a truly airworthy solution. Early testing proved just how fragile the setup was. In 1972, during a demo flight for FAA officials meant to clear the airplane for Oshkosh, the engine quit cold. The test pilot managed to dead stick it into a safe landing, but the damage was done. The FAA refused to issue a display permit, and the BD-5's reputation for being temperamental was sealed before most customers even opened their crates. Jim Beatty's ambitions were every bit as high-octane as his marketing. Convinced he could bring high-performance flying within reach of the average pilot, he pushed the company to move faster than its engineering base could sustain. His enthusiasm pulled in thousands of builders, but his impatience to deliver meant cutting corners that no test pilot or mechanic would sign off on. Those choices, driven more by optimism than data, ended up defining the BD-5's entire flight path. Despite the design still being rough around the edges, BD kept the throttle wide open. He continued taking orders and even floated ideas for a factory-built certified version, but the main variants were the BD-5A short-wing version, BD-5B long-wing version, BD-5S, the sailplane, and BD-5J, the jet version. Deposits kept rolling in, and before long, hundreds of pilots thought they'd soon be flying an FAA-approved version straight out of the box. At the same time, BD was already chasing something even flashier, a turbine-powered follow-up, the BD-5J microjet. That one actually flew. The BD-5J made its debut at the 1973 Oshkosh Air Show and by 1974 was flying formation routines as a three-ship demo team. For a while, it looked like BD had finally cracked it. The microjet was fast, clean, and crowd-pleasing, proof that at least one version of his dream could get off the ground. But behind the scenes, the company was running out of altitude and options. Hearth, the supplier of the piston engines, went bankrupt in 1974, cutting off BD's only power plant source. That left hundreds of kits sitting in garages and hangars with no engines to install. BD scrambled to line up a replacement, eventually striking a deal with Zenoa in Japan for a new engine, but the program lagged badly. By 1976, the project was running on fumes. Development delays, missing engines, and a growing number of frustrated builders all piled up. And by 1979, BD aircraft had gone down for good. Even so, over 3,000 customers had already sent in full or partial payments. A surprising number of them, more than 3,000 by some counts, took delivery of their kits around 1973, hoping they could finish what the factory couldn't. But for most, the real fight was just beginning. For the builders who actually received their kits, the real turbulence was just beginning. The boxes showed up incomplete. Airframes without engines, hardware missing, manuals vague at best. The build-it-in-your-garage dream quickly turned into a long-term project that demanded serious fabrication skills and persistence. The biggest missing piece was still the power plant. There simply wasn't a proven engine available that matched the airplane's tight weight and balance envelope. Builders were left on their own to source or adapt something that might work, not exactly the plug-and-play kit they were promised. Then there was the build time. Beatty had advertised 600 to 800 hours to get the airplane flying. In reality, most owners logged closer to 3,000 hours, if they finished at all. 
Out of the roughly 3,000 kits delivered, only about 200 BD-5s were ever completed and flown, and even those that did make it to the runway had a rough record. Around 15% of all completed BD-5s were eventually lost in fatal accidents, an alarming number by any standard. Most of those crashes happened on first flights, before pilots really had a feel for the airplane's quirks. Of the first four home-built BD-5As, three went down on takeoff, killing their builders, and the fourth crashed on its first landing. Sadly, that record has followed the design well into the modern era. BD-5s are still flying and still occasionally falling out of the sky. The most recent fatal accident came in 2019 at Camarillo, California, when 82-year-old pilot John Lewis lost power and went down shortly after takeoff. That said, it wouldn't be fair to call the BD-5 a bad airplane outright. There are still dozens flying today, including several on the airshow circuit. Many seasoned pilots who've flown it describe it as a pure, responsive little machine when it's properly built and rigged. Even among home-builts of its generation, the BD-5 sat in a strange corner of the flight line. The very ease that came along a few years later could match its speed and range, but did so with a lower wing loading, easier construction, and a much cleaner safety record. The KR-2 and Sonarai, meanwhile, were honest little sport planes, predictable, forgiving, and simple to maintain. The BD-5, by contrast, gave up margin for looks and performance. It was a thoroughbred in a world of workhorses, fast and sleek, but with handling that demanded precision. Its reputation was built on ambition rather than practicality, which is why pilots still talk about it with both admiration and caution. When it was trimmed right and the engine stayed running, the aircraft flies beautifully. The bigger issue was what sat behind the pilot. The engine was mounted high above the center of gravity, so the thrust line actually pushed the nose down under power. If the engine quit, and they often did, that sudden loss of thrust caused the nose to pitch up aggressively, setting the stage for a stall or worse. On top of that, the BD-5 center of gravity envelope was razor thin. Small changes in pilot weight, fuel load, or baggage could shift it right out of limits. Get it even slightly aft and the airplane became twitchy. Get it too far forward and you'd struggle to flare. Combine that with the aircraft's slick aerodynamics and high wing loading, and the BD-5 demanded a pilot who was on their game from brake release to shutdown. All of these quirks were amplified by one major limitation. The BD-5 was strictly a single-seater. There was no two-seat trainer or a checkout flight with an instructor, so every pilot's first takeoff in the BD-5 was also their first solo in type. You either got it right, or you didn't. To try and bridge that gap, Beattie came up with a creative but questionable workaround, a training rig that suspended the BD-5 in front of a speeding truck, letting prospective pilots practice takeoffs and landings while being towed down a runway. It was a clever idea in theory, but it was hardly a substitute for dual instruction. And when the company went bankrupt in 1979, even that limited support disappeared. The airplane's narrow CG envelope, relatively high stall speed, and sensitive controls already made it unforgiving. Add in the variable build quality that comes with home-built aircraft, mismatched rigging, uneven weight distribution, and engine conversions, and you had a design that left almost no room for error. But the biggest factor behind the BD-5's downfall was the same thing that had haunted it from day one, the engine. The Hearth snowmobile motor just wasn't up to the job. It took far longer than anyone expected to adapt it for sustained flight, and reliability was always hit or miss. Beatty, ever the optimist, believed the fix was just around the corner. In his 2008 memoir, he admitted just how naive that confidence was. We were so confident that it would just be a simple matter of flight testing these Hearth engines and then we would be able to begin delivery to our customers, he wrote. We were naive enough to think that putting an engine in an airplane was not much different than installing a radio. BD went ahead and started shipping BD-5 kits. Wings, fuselage, control surfaces, everything short of a proven power plant so builders could start assembling while they waited for the final version of the hearth engine to be ready. 
When that engine still wasn't sorted months later, he offered an alternative, a so-called fairly reliable off-the-shelf unit. As you'd expect, most builders passed. Nobody wanted to hang their neck on a fairly reliable engine in a clean sheet airplane. The real issue was how Beattie approached development. Instead of the usual step-by-step -step flight test and certification process, what we'd call sequential development, he jumped straight into production while the prototype was still being refined. That kind of concurrent development might save calendar time on paper, but it's a nightmare when problems pop up in testing. Once those issues are baked into dozens or hundreds of partially built airframes, every fix becomes 10 times harder and more expensive to implement. With a more methodical flight test program and a disciplined production ramp, the BD-5's technical challenges could have been solved. In fact, many owners later modified their airplanes with improved systems, better weight distribution, and more reliable power plants, turning them into safer, better handling machines. But Beattie's enthusiasm got ahead of the engineering. Instead of slowing down and fixing the fundamentals, he doubled down on marketing. He kept collecting deposits and selling the dream even as major issues were still unresolved. Some of his customer practices bordered on unethical, promising delivery dates he couldn't meet and glossing over real aerodynamic and structural problems. Bert Rutten who worked briefly for Beattie early in his career, later talked about the experience in an interview. According to Rutan, Beattie routinely downplayed serious design challenges and used oversimplified aerodynamic calculations to justify performance numbers that were frankly impossible. Coming from one of the most respected engineers in the field, that's a telling critique of just how far optimism had overtaken data at Beattie Aircraft. In the end, Beattie collected and burned through millions of dollars in deposits and kit payments. The company bounced from one target to another. First the BD-5 kit plane, then a promised certified production model for the U.S., then a proposed certification effort in New Zealand, and finally the flashy BD-5J microjet. Each new direction drained more cash and time while leaving early builders stranded mid-project. When the criticism started mounting, Beatty defended his approach. In his memoir, he argued that the deposits were the only way to gauge real demand and get suppliers on board. In his words, the BD-5 never would have become the high-quality home-built kit it became without those deposits and allowing us to know the real market. But history tells a different story. The BD-5 was a solid aerodynamic concept that fell victim to rush testing, production shortcuts, and business optimism that outclimbed its technical ceiling. Even a good design can turn dangerous when development gets ahead of validation. And as every pilot knows, when something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Don't forget to subscribe and ring that notification bell. It helps me a lot.